This session is concerned with building capability using modern methods, systems, techniques, which all interlink to deliver through value chain principles. I hope you enjoy uh, this series that we put together for you, and I hope that uh, you will manage uh, to absorb the principle itself uh, to derive some uh, uh, ideas and benefits from these first-hand best practice experiences that we've compiled together. And more importantly, I hope that these ideas can serve the purpose of assisting you in putting together improvement action plans and hopefully in the pursuit of excellence in your organizations. What I would, would like to do this evening is Mohammed has painted the, the big business scene on value and values. What I'd like to do is, is to share with you a, um, a simple case study of um, Arla Foods uh, to just show you what it's been trying to do with people and values over recent years. But to do this I, I really first have to put the business um, in context which may give you some clues as to why Arla has gone down this route. So the first question, you know, who are Arla? Well, they're actually the, uh, the largest dairy group in Europe. Um, they process 7.1 billion litres uh, of milk every year. It's uh, Scandinavian owned, it is a cooperative business uh, owned by 19,000 Danish and Swedish farmers. Um, again, the name isn't well known because when we buy milk from a supermarket, we don't care who's processed it. Milk is milk is milk is milk. Uh, as long as we're buying, you know, what we want, i.e. do we want the four pint, the six pint, the skim, the skim, semi-skim, the full fat, we're not bothered. But on top of that, in processing and adding value to products, um, Arla is involved in a number of categories in the UK. I think probably the best known branded product is, is Lurpak Butter. Uh, uh, Gulp is quite well known, the, the flavoured milk drink. Also a lot of speciality cheeses. Uh, we've got to make speciality cheeses because we Brits, very boring, you know, 93% uh, of cheese sold in the UK is cheddar. You know, we're very conservative. Uh, but there is a big industrial market for industrial cheeses for, for people like McDonald's and, uh, and Pizza Hut. Also branded milk, uh, which I'll talk about later. So in the UK, um, six manufacturing sites, uh, geographically spread. Um, this was a challenge in itself because um, the Danish owners expanded to the UK in 1992. They wanted to sell more Danish products. And the retailers said, well, okay, give us a full dairy offering and you know we might be interested and so the, the response was great so they bought a lot of dairies whoever wanted to sell a dairy uh, you know co-op Lord Rayleigh's farms who's got a dairy to sell well you can bet your life the people who were selling the dairies were not selling the top of the range stuff and top of the range skills and technology so this is what the business does in a year nearly a billion litres of milk processed um, 2,000 people and big and growing market shares and we supply all the key retailers because initially the dairy produced bottled milk for doorstep which uh, uh, is a declining sector of business now so you know the big market share no complacency because there's some uh, some things happening probably as in your world that makes it very very tough in dairy processing at the moment this is why we seek change this is why we seek answers this is why we seek to add value this is why we seek competitive advantage through doing the things that our competitors aren't doing. We've all got the same technology, all got access to cows, all got the same funding to, to a large extent, so what is going to make the competitive difference? Let me just share with you some of the issues in our business. We start off in 92 largely providing milk for the doorstep. It's dying. You will, you will tell your grandchildren with pride, I remember milk being delivered to the doorstep. And they'll laugh at you. Um, it's not only a change in habits, it's also a change. People do not want to be milkmen. 
rotten job up at half past two in the morning trying to get money out of people who don't want to pay you retailers um, winners and losers fighting their own battles for success in the marketplace and one of our biggest customers is Asda Walmart who are driving change which everyone else will have to follow you've no choice if you want to supply them competitors um, four big players in the industry at the moment the analysts will say that is one too many there is too much milk chasing a declining market that is a fact in terms of suppliers farmers well I think everyone's fairly familiar with with their problems uh, of late um, I don't really want to say any more about that except draw to your attention the number of suppliers is rapidly declining people are exiting the industry too hard not enough money and the products uh, people like any uh, FMCG looking for higher value added to the products um, health issues surrounding milk there's always some uh, some scare in the papers and technology changing rapidly being driven by sophisticated retailers um, which it was it was great in the old days you know you put milk on the back of a lorry and it ended up at the back door of a supermarket you know we'll do a deal with you on milk you know how much do you want this month not that simple anymore so in terms of fresh milk in our business this is what happens in a month 30,000 drops um, 43 million litres to the retailers 7 million litres wholesale nearly a million miles travelled in our distribution 371 vehicles on the road consistency is the challenge we have to do this day in day out it's not as safe to say okay we'll take 30 pallets of milk a week on Wednesday thank you some of the large stores demand uh, milk drops up to four times a day they do not place their orders sometimes until 12 hours before because they want to see what, how quickly it's coming off the shelves so consistency both for service and quality is the challenge at simple level getting the right product to the right place at the right time and not having it turned away if we're half an hour late there's also people like you and I called consumers who are really you know making things complicated now um, we have to respond to this changing world you know 24 hour a day seven day a week retailing all the other things you know virtual banks the world's changing it's uh, difficult now the choice of TV channels doesn't help when we're trying to advertise our uh, products or any other uh, FMCG you cannot get through to your consumers anymore a change in habits will affect our business we spend more eating out uh, I think this was last year than we than we do buying food to consume indoors um, new challenges for us perhaps then to supply um, the food manufacturers themselves so you might uh, before too long buy uh, croissants or whatever with Lurpak butter in them or indeed just selling direct uh, to organizations that I mentioned such as McDonald Pizza Hut and the like and ready grated cheese gosh who would have thought of this ten years ago increasingly cash rich time poor we can't be bothered grating cheese you know buy it in and look at what companies are doing you know car manufacturers getting into banking uh, uh, a record company getting into coca-cola um, buying electricity from gas companies you know, where does it end it doesn't end it doesn't it goes on and we ourselves you know we're, we're promiscuous in our brand choice we are not acting the people we are we've discovered as consumers we can be anyone we want to be and manufacturers have to respond to this market one person what are they going to look like today what are they going to want tomorrow how will they react the day after increasingly very very difficult to predict and the truth is that we're drinking less milk it's declining for various reasons this is this is the farmers problem they're getting less and less for their raw milk 
why don't, the, why don't we pay them more for their milk? Because the supermarkets won't pay us more for processing it. The, uh, the retailers are of the view that milk, like bread, is a staple, basic commodity that gets footfall in their stores. They will not pay more for it. I wonder if any of you how, know actually how much you, you pay for milk when you buy it. I don't, I just take it off the shelf. You don't think, well, it's a bit dear, I'll leave it this week. We're probably fairly illiterate in what we pay for our milk. So, milk processors are finding it hard. Four big players in the game. If you look at the chart there, look how the, the smaller um, processors over the years have been squeezed out. Whether exiting the business altogether or through merger and amalgamation. And um, there is one too many players on the pitch at this moment in time. Everybody of these big four is talking to everybody else. And uh, hey, there's not much money in it either. That also, the, the trends there on profitability is probably uh, true for the share capital of these organisations. It's not a get-rich-quick business. Uh, and the retailers, very strong. The most sophisticated retailers, arguably, outside America. Uh, those are our um, customers. Uh, we like to think we've backed uh, the right ones, uh, Tesco uh, and Asda in particular. But they are driving changes in our systems as well. We have to react to their requirements. So what is our value chain? Hey, it's very simple. Cows give milk, we collect it from farms, we take it to a dairy, we process it, pasteurise it, Heat it up, cool it down, put it in a container, get it on the back of a lorry, out to the back door of a supermarket. Supermarket puts it on the shelves and you pick it up. What could be easier? Okay, that's for raw milk if we're processing uh, other products, sort of cheeses, fromage, frais, yogurts, it's a bit more complicated. So what is the challenge for us in this simple value chain? <laughs> Hidden in there is our supply chain and we're doing a lot of work to improve this working with uh, Professor Zari's team at Bradford. Why are we into this? Because we are food processors and because we work on low margins we're very pragmatic and we want convincing. Well it sounds good we've heard the lecture and we've read the book but what's the reality? So we look around so, well, who else has done this and have they benefited from it? Well, yeah, Walmart, Walmart, gosh, yeah, that's a good example to follow. So we need evidence that, that it actually works. And we look in general, say, well, you know, can we get payback from supply chain excellence? And the indications we probably can if we look at the experience of others. We're also trying another tack, if, if supply chain is taking time and cost out of the system and improving efficiencies, then we need to look also at adding value to, uh, to milk. Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with, uh, with Cravendale, it's the first advance in branded milk since pasteurisation. Um, what it does, we've, we've adopted um, brewing technology through filtering out more bacteria from milk. Some people will say it tastes better than fresh milk. Um, the truth is, I don't know, uh, but what it does do is it lasts longer because there, there are more bacteria taken out uh, than you would in, in normal pasteurisation. And it's not the heat treated stuff that tastes awful anyway. The other line to pursue is organic, as I've mentioned, people are changing, we're all different, uh, the market's fragmenting in our needs, so we brought on a, uh, an organic brand called Harmony. Uh, there is a shortage of organic milk um, in this country at the moment. Uh, again, you can't just switch on the tap for organic milk. Uh, a normal farm uh, will probably take up to five years to be recognised by the Soil Association uh, as um, having converted to organic and then the farmers say okay we'll convert what's in it for us well nothing actually we're not going to pay you anymore then there's the technology again driven by our very very sophisticated um, retailers yes they want more better quality better service 
Of course they do, because we demand it. Uh, blow moulding, you, you know the, the plastic bottles um, you buy your milk in the supermarket. We actually produce these in our dairies now. We used to buy them in. We actually produce them in the dairies. Flexibility, don't know what the milk order is for Friday yet. They haven't decided. Uh, we've got to deliver it. It's no good saying, well, sorry, I haven't got any of that. It's got to be there. ESL is extended shelf life milk. Uh, which means simply milk that lasts longer. Uh, it can be held in the supply chain longer. We've got to deliver that. How do we deliver that? Through improving um, technical quality, um, taking more uh, contaminants out of the system through better hygiene levels, etc., etc. <coughs> Uh, another uh, advance being part of Europe is, uh, I'm not an expert on this, electronic article numbers, barcodes, common barcoding across Europe. Uh, for instance, Lurpak Butter, as doing Leeds, may say, hang on, we can buy your Lurpak direct from Denmark, a penny cheaper. As long as it's got the same barcode on, we're not really worried. Um, E-commerce, the dreaded E-word, integration throughout, uh, value-added services being demanded, uh, not only get the milk there on time, but looking for advisory services on such things as shelf planning in predicting consumer behaviour. Um, it used to be just selling it and that was it. It's now the value we add is the, not just the milk, but it's the services we provide to our retailer, which is often advice, consultancy, uh, and even sometimes training for their uh, back-of-store staff on handling food products. So, in terms of a value chain model, I mean, this is basically what the textbooks say. Uh, organizational infrastructure, we'll come on to that. Technology and procurement, had a quick overview of that. Uh, and then the logistics to services, the supply chain, uh, I shared with you what's happening in our business. But what about this thing called people? because uh, ex extended shelf life milk isn't going to switch on people and the search for profit and margin isn't going to switch them on either. So where are we with our people? Let me take a step back to define for you what we understand in, in Arla by some of these terms. Value chain simple. Customer first, customer last. Full stop. The whole purpose of the organisation Values, what do we mean? The set of organisational standards and beliefs that are utilised to guide day-to-day -day operations. And the vision, what, is, what does it look like when it's finished? So that's the vision, to be the natural first choice dairy company. This vision originated, as did the values, simple values, based on, on what I've said, quality, customer and people. In the old days we would have probably said um, send for KPMG or whoever and tell us what the, uh, the vision is and the mission. Tell us what the values are and they would have done and taken a check and we'd have said thank you very much what do we do with them now. What happened in this case was this was an internally owned process that we took people around the business and said what's it all about? What are we here to do? How are we going to do it? The values being the enablers. We also talk to our customers. What do they think this business is about or should it be about? We talk to our suppliers, primarily the farmers, and we talk to a number of people in the business. What do you think? We talk to our owners in Denmark. So there's input from many sources, but the actual values were developed by a, an iterative process internally. This working group said, we think it's about this. And this was presented to the management board, and they said, well, maybe, maybe not, have another think. And so on and so on. So these were homegrown. These were owned internally. They were owned internally because we thought we got them right. Uh, and we went to the management board in Denmark. And the management board in Denmark could have said, yeah, okay, great, carry on. But management boards feel they have to say something. And um, they said, well, yeah, yeah, great. Um, get something about being fast forward looking and flexible. So the message came back to this cross-functional group of champions who basically said, tell them to mind their own business. You know, these are our values. How dare you? You only own the company. Uh, 
fast, forward-looking and flexible stayed out. So how did we get to this value? 92, the business came, acquired dairies, <coughs> regionally owned, regional dairies serving regional markets, largely serving the doorstep customer. Developed into uh, a functional basis, started to think, you know, one strategy, one approach. <coughs> Business started to turn around about 95. Some of the original dairies bought were closed, some new came on board, um, looked at the internal processes, made the focus on quality. And 96, a decision to go down the road directly of, of serving the large retailers. Within this time frame, the business lost 43 million pounds. The big change came in 96 with a new chief executive, wanted to put greater focus on people uh, and so we started some of the, you know, the Manchester Airport School of Management approaches, you know, the little paperbacks of 50 pages telling you how to change the world. So we had suggestion schemes and fun days and involvement groups and all the rest of it. It didn't stick because to some extent this, this was um, a reflection of, of Mohammed's artifacts, you know, well it's all about being nice to each other, isn't it? Um, and we had the posters and the key rings and the t-shirts. But then we also went into something more profound, the infrastructure of the organisation. Annualised hours, uh, got in some of the, the old culture of the foods industry, which made it very unappealing for many people. Harmonised terms and conditions, simple structures across all sites. Uh, if you'd have gone to an MD food site, as it was MD in those days, in, in 96, you'd have seen different people wearing different uniforms, following different factory systems, being paid different wages and having different grades. There were 39 different grades. So it was brought together. We rationalised the people, we rationalised through Max Plus the systems, we looked at the manufacturing processes we looked at the structure of the business. So, okay, we'd, we'd done the soft stuff with the people, we'd done the hard stuff with the trade union negotiations and common identity, and then we started asking the question, what's it all about? What is this company trying to do? What does this company value? What's the image it projects to its employees, to its customers, its owners? And we didn't know. So we called this project Soul, which was to look at the heart of the company and what it was all about. And again, being pragmatic, why did we do this? Had we read it in the book and said, hmm, uh, values-driven culture sounds all right, let's try something. No. We did a lot of research and we were taken by um, factual information such as this, that in the medium to long term it would, if we got it right, make us more successful, it would drive customer satisfaction further. Again, we tended to look to um, American companies who were perhaps more advanced uh, in these techniques and in terms of the hard bottom line um, financial uh, ratios, uh, it seemed to make a lot of sense of values driven culture and gosh Walmart were doing it, that was uh, uh, pretty inspirational. So we thought yeah let's do it. We learnt a lot, we learnt a lot through this exercise because customer service was top of the agenda and we thought well you know as long as the milk turns up there in the right quantities to the right quality at the right time every day we'll be all right won't we so we thought well what's you know what makes this outcome we understood the operational side, yes, the industry standards, the um, legislative quality standards that are imposed. Uh, we understood the customer offering, understanding what they wanted and what they thought about us and what their targets for us were. And we understood our systems, uh, our factory-based systems, our technology. And there was a realisation, it, it was kind of a road to Damascus time. What, what about the behaviours? Did our behaviours support the operational factors. Well, 
probably not. So we realised we needed a big push on the behaviours and this is the competitive edge. We needed to look at various things to do with people. And this kind of, you know, sort of screamed culture and values at us. So, what was the other advantage? This project soul, values culture. A change process, three core values, simple core values, nothing clever in that. Uh, the company had, had changed its name to Arla when the Swedish side of the business merged. Uh, so we got a nice little um, Arla advantage, it sounded good. And yes, again, we went through the key rings and the t-shirts and, and the artifacts. The change process, as I mentioned, was line-owned. Uh, it was led by a champions group representing uh, cross-functional um, teams within the business and on all of our operating sites. So what did they do? They developed the values. Here are the values, the people values. Nothing uh, particularly fancy or, or clever there. Uh, simple statements of how we want to behave and how we want to be seen to behave. This is for consumption not only to uh, our employees but also to um, our customers. So what do we want to do in terms of quality? <coughs> what do we want to do in terms of our customers? <coughs> so fine you think, you know, well you, you've got your values we could have stopped there, and a lot of companies do. You, you say, here are the values, uh, you put them on a plastic card, uh, you send them out to employees, uh, you put them on the poster on the walls, and you think, great, we've got value now, let's tick the box. Done that, we values culture. We realised from experience that this wouldn't work, because all these terms perhaps mean different things to different people in such a diverse and complex business. So we wanted everyone to understand the values. Our process was, we, we designed a two-day program. Um, the champions group, internal people, this, this thing about ownership again, uh, said, well, how can we get all leaders in the business, whatever that leader's called, a team leader or chief executive or marketing director, all leaders, we'll train them in the principles uh, of the other advantage and what these value sets actually mean. So we train trainers and we delivered internal programs to, to all our managers. Uh, which was a wonderful experience in culture and value because on some of these um, programs you would have a board director and a junior uh, you know, team leader from Essex uh, uh, and a, a salesperson from uh, Preston, whatever. And it was a rich mix and it got people talking together. Okay, so leaders then hopefully understood the other advantage, but we wanted them to engage their teams in what it meant for them. So we developed uh, on each site, in each department, in each function, a champions group. They were the people who were going to drive it forward. And as much as anything, we wanted them to inspire people, but also measure and monitor what was actually happening on the ground. I won't use the, the term police it, but to actually ensure that it actually happened. And of course, the point that, that Mohammed makes well is if then you do achieve the outcomes you want, you celebrate the success. So what happened to the other advantage? For each of the, the value sets, there was a, a mini little program. Uh, here's an hour advantage session in progress. Each colleague, as we call ourselves now, has a little yellow book with all the rationale for the values in, what they are, where they've come from, what it means. Each leader has um, a presenter, a bit like the old reps used to give you, uh, and they run once a month a session on each of the values that the team sits down together and discusses that particular value, what it means for them, and what they are going to do to deliver it. So if you like, this is a bottom-up approach 
to improvement through values. Before this, we had suggestion schemes, you know, and people, had, it was always things for other people to do, like, you know, why don't you resurface the car park, or why don't we make garlic flavoured butter, or, you know, this kind of thing. And in suggestion schemes, they'd go to some committee, and the committee would think, what do we do with this? You know, haven't a clue. Um, and, you know, the person who put in the idea, uh, you know, would wait six months, not get a reply, and say, oh, blow it, I'm not doing that again. So this was local people making improvements to their own work process. And it is very, very powerful. If you imagine this business geographically spread, that these sessions are happening all over. The board do them. The senior marketing team do them. The management team of the factory in Newcastle do it. The team of drivers in North London do it. The people who push trolleys of milk around the dairy do it in Preston. Because those values mean different things to different people. So it's not top down trying to interpret it. It's the team deciding what it means for them and what they want to, to do with it. This is a format of the sessions. Um, I picked this one at random. Uh, the title of the session, um, what do we mean in terms of always delivering uh, to agreed quality standards, why it's important to us. So the team actually do a bit of, you know, thinking about this. Who are our partners? And this is why it's got to be localised, because the partners to the marketing team in Leeds is very different to the, to the team of uh, lorry drivers in North London. So we don't think big picture, we think specific, we think local. That team decides, well, what are the do's and don'ts? Um, you know, what are we doing now that's helping to build the partnership? What else can we do? What are our existing quality standards? You know, can we improve these? They're coming to their conclusions. Is there anything else we can do? This is not a, a, a ritual, um, you know, well, we've, we've done this bit now, we'll move on to the next one next month. Uh, in some areas, people are still on session one after six months. So complex and knotty are the issues. So it's not mechanical, we've done the number six, we're doing number seven next month. And then the important thing, well, it's fine talking about it, isn't it? But what are we going to do about it? Uh, so after each session, an action plan is agreed that that team can do, not, not what someone else can do. And so they implement their plan. You know, nothing, it's probably nothing clever or fancy. It's little incremental steps. And so the next session, when se Section 7 comes around, they will review, well, have we done our action plan? If not, why not? We've done it great now. Let's move on to the next. So those are the other advantage sessions, very simply. It's not everything. OK, values, driven culture, it's not everything. You see, we've built a house in Arla. And you see that the foundations are the other advantage behaviours, supply chain excellence and customer focus. Customer focus is a, another drive to get closer to our customer, to understand what they really, really need, to understand from them, oh, we're measuring our service to you, are we measuring the right things? Um, what else do you want about from good quality milk? What do you think of our administration? What do you think about our logistics? What do you think about our people? What do you think about our innovation rate? So it's getting closer and closer. So these foundations are, if we were talking uh, the excellence model, we would call those the enablers. So they're not an end in itself. They are enablers so that we can pursue excellence in our five category strategies. Uh, and each of our strategies, whether it's butter spreads and margarine, cheese, milk, fresh dairy products or organic, we have category strategies. And through this approach, through the house, this is the route that we believe we will deliver our mission to be the f natural first choice dairy company. So what's it meant for people? Well, yeah, it's, it's all very complex now, isn't it? The certainties of the past are gone, just as the certainties of consumer behaviour are gone. Uh, we are becoming discriminating consumers of work, just as we are discriminating consumers of products. So employers need to, to have a, a look at this again. So what will be 
the employee's role in the future. Well, in our business, it's actually to have a say. Arla is not a company that's got strict gradings and strict levels and, you know, you get a 2% increase every year. And, uh, it tries to be enterprising and through the Arla Advantage sessions, give free reign in, in, a, in, a, in a proper way, not a lip service way, to people's potential. It's your team, you're part of that team. You do what you want to improve it. No one's going to stop you doing anything. If you don't feel comfortable in this culture, then you really ought to review your own situation. And again, we have to recruit against these kind of criteria. And we use elements of our values for, uh, for recruitment purposes. Um, and we're very explicit uh, at induction and recruitment. Say, look, this is the sort of business you're joining. You may not like it. We very we have to be honest, what we can give people. Clarity about what's expected of them. What am I here for? Why am I here? We can offer them recognition. Don't say reward, mind. Recognition. Emotional payback, not just financial payback. Clarity of what the business is doing to support you to do what you want to do, whether it's training and development, whether it's to pursue an improvement activity, an environment where you can really give of your best. No one will actually say no, unless you're contravening some health and safety or um, food hygiene issue. But equally, what we can't do for you, can't offer you a secure job, look at the problems in our industry, what's happening. We can't make you happy, love to. The world's just a little more complicated than that. Because of the markets, can't guarantee your income, can't guarantee no changing circumstances, and so on. And this is the new honesty, not the, the job for life. Is this the sort of place you want to work for? You know, we're free agents, we make our choice against these criteria. So you might be thinking, well, you know, it's born a bit soft and whatnot. What's this got to do with, uh, why haven't we gone down through the route of total quality? I believe we have. We just haven't labelled it total quality. We haven't labelled it excellence, but it's the same route. People, systems and processes. And through my presentation today, I, I've scratched the surface that we are pursuing improvements in people, processes and systems. So it is total quality by another name. Are we getting there? It's a journey, it's a lengthy journey. Progress is being made, we're not developing whole new rafts of measures for this, but we're looking at the impact, we're looking at the causal effect of our values culture on our existing measures. And, and we operate a balanced scorecard, financials, quality, customer and people. So. We're not looking to say, well, does this justify itself? We're saying, look at the improvement trend on our hard measures. So that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is a very quick walk through one organisation's experience of adopting a values-driven culture. Thank you very much. I hope you have enjoyed the session. And indeed, I hope you have managed to derive some key lessons and perhaps some prompts from the conceptual side of uh, adopting excellence and from the application that uh, you have just uh, witnessed. Thank you.